Okay, so I will just assume that that's going to work. Um, if not, the project files will be available and the slides as well. So anyway, let's get started. So today we are going to look at what problems live data and view models will solve for you, uh, when you would want to use it. Um, I'm going to spoil you almost in every app you create and how to include it, which is just a Gradle implementation. So that's going to be pre pretty straightforward, just two lines. And finally, we're going to do a live example, which builds upon what we did last week with the navigation, except now the focus is on uh, the view models and the live data and how that's going to help make the app easier to write and more uh, readable and understandable in the long term. So it's going to be more maintainable as well. That's a question, so there's a poll. Okay, that's good, it's answered. So yeah, you should be able to do this at any time and I will get this notification down here. Um, yes, let's go on. So view models. Uh, in short, view models is a construct that will help you store the data that is required by your UI in a safe way and that's going to survive configuration changes. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, I'm going to refer to your first assignment again because you're all familiar with it. Uh, when you had data stored in your assignment and you rotated your phone, a lot of that data would just disappear. So rotating your phone is an example of a configuration change where the phone will, where Android will in fact, when you rotate your phone, it will first destroy your activity and wipe everything that's in it it will apply the configuration and then the activity will be constructed all over again. So basically you go through on destroy, on create, on resume and all of that when you rotate your phone, which means if you had any data stored in your activity, all of that's going to be destroyed because you have rotated your phone and destroyed the activity. So after rotation, you're working with a brand new activity instance. And that instance does not know what data you used to have before. Uh, however, a view model, will help you store the data and survive configuration changes, which means even if you rotate your phone, the view model will still be able to retain the data that was there before you rotated the phone. Uh, so the general recommendation here is that all the data required by your UI, you should store this in the view model. So the view model is like a data container for everything your UI needs to stay up to date. Because if you store it in the activity, not only it's going to break on configuration changes, if you actually want to maintain it, you have to use the on save and on restore instance state functions in order to be able to uh, restore the data, which not only requires that you write a lot of boilerplate code, just to, be, just to make sure for every variable you want to keep, you have to save it in the instance state and restore it. But the instance state is also not very flexible in that it can't hold every kind of data and, you know, if you have huge data sources, you, it's not going to be very nice to use it in there. Also, um, it's worth noting that view models do not completely replace on restore or an on save instance state. Uh, they, they both have their uses and you, at some points you will have to use both of them. But I'll show an example of when you have to use both or when it could be smart. But um, in my experience, uh, in most cases, view models will be enough. So, uh, no questions so far, um, and no issues otherwise, I think. Um, seems to be fine. Okay, then we can move on. So this is just uh, the Gradle requirement slide. Uh, just put this implementation, Android X lifecycle, lifecycle view model KTX, is what you need for view models. And view model is then part of the lifecycle library. Um, so uh, the reason the, life, the view models are able to keep the data alive throughout activity or fragment uh, rotations is because the view model is tied to uh, the scope of the activity rather than the activity itself. So when you create an activity, it goes through on create, on start, on resume. And then say you rotate your phone, it's going to be paused, stopped, destroyed, and then you're gonna create a new one. In which case um, you have the data that was in the original activity is gone. However, 
your view model um, belongs to the scope of, of the activity instead, which means as long as the activity is supposed to be on screen, the view model is aware of this. So it's a lifecycle aware class because it's aware of the lifecycle of its owner. And if the owner is an activity, then the view model will live until the activity is finished. So basically when you leave the activity and you, or you, you, it's no longer alive at all. Like even though it's rotated, the activity is still logically on screen. But when you finish the activity, close your app or uh, change to another activity without keeping the old one, then the view model is going to destroy itself and call on cleared. So do we need a view model for each activity? Uh, it's generally a good idea to have a view model for each activity that requires data, so which most activities do. Likewise for fragments, um, uh, if you have a view model per fragment, that's going to be uh, nice as well because then if uh, the fragment, when the, the fragment's on screen and the phone rotates, for example, it's going to be able to retain the data that's relevant for this particular fragment. So view models can be scoped either to activities or to fragments. Uh, and depending on what the, their scope to, it's going to alter their lifetime to basically follow the lifetime of their owner. Um, however, one thing view models cannot do is uh, if you are in a fragment or an activity, go to another fragment or activity and then go back, uh, the view model will, be, will have been cleared out because the other original activity or fragment had a period of time where it was not on the screen anymore. Um, which means view model is not a replacement for uh, long-term persistence. It's just there to make sure uh, that particular fragment or activity is consistent for as long as it's on the screen. If you want the data to be retained um, for longer, for example, if you go from one fragment to another and then back and you want the data to still be there, you're going to have to use some other persistence model like a database or shared preferences. Um, However, there are ways to get around that because you can use view models can also be shared between different fragments or activities, which means if you use one view model for three fragments, they all can share the data of that same view model as long as they are in the same activity. So we're going to show an example of that uh, afterwards. But uh, that's a very powerful concept as well because view models then allow you to simply share data between, between multiple UI components. So for example, if you take your first assignment, you could have your expenses list in the view model and then all of your three activities or fragments could share that data. So you would just would add data to the view model and then any other activity could instantly uh, read from that data, which is a lot simpler than, <coughs> sorry, uh, than uh, passing data back and forth with, for example, start activity for result or with fragments passing them as arguments or so basically the view model would have solved a lot of your problems for the first assignment. Is, uh, do we need a view model if we have a database? Um, yeah, it's usually nice to keep the database in the view model, like a reference to it. So that uh, even if you wrote at your phone, you don't have to curate the database again to get the data out of it. For example, if you have like thousand names in the database, you just want to get fetch those names in on, once. And then if, <clears throat> when your phone rotates, if it's a slow query, you don't want to do the query again after the rotation because you can just retain the result from the database in the view model. Um, so that's actually going to be part of the live data section where we're going to use the database as well and with the view model to show an example of that. But the important thing here is, is that the life cycle outlives its activity and or fragments. Uh, and that's what allows it to keep the data beyond rotations, for example. Uh, some caveats, yeah, as I mentioned, it does not replace on restore instance state in all cases. For example, if uh, Android figures out that your phone has run out of memory or is taking too much CPU and decides to kill your process, uh, that the view model will no longer keep that data. So if you have data that's important to keep, even though you killed the, your app was killed by the operating system or uh, your phone crashed or went out of power, that's when you have to use on restore instance state instead because it's going to be able to keep the instance state even through um, uh, when the operating system, for example, kills your app because you're out of memory. So on restore instance state, will they be able to restore some state 
even after a crash or something like that, but the uh, view modulus is only tied to the current instance of your application. Which means, but at the same time, restore instance state, you don't want to keep a lot of data in here. So a good uh, way to think about this is that if you, for example, are logged in as a user, you would like to maybe just store the user ID in the instance state, and then you can use the view model with the database to just fetch the data for that user. That way you restore all the data just by knowing the ID of the user you want to have information on. So use this one for small, important pieces of data that can help you restore the rest of the data with the view model. Also, yeah, also as mentioned, when you change fragments, the data is still gone between transitions, uh, which means if I want to store a number in one fragment in its view model, navigate to another fragment and come back, uh, the data is gone. So uh, unless you set it up to be shared between different fragments, which we will look at. And also make sure that uh, your, when you create your view model, it's not supposed to do all the logic in your app. Um, it should mostly be a data container and that lets you do basic operations on the data. For example, uh, a good approach is to keep all of the logic that's related to the UI in your activity and or fragment. So everything that operates with buttons, views, that kind of thing, that goes in the UI. And the view model is sort of an intermediate data storage in between. So the UI is sort of like a controller and the uh, view model is like the model. So if you think about the model view controller, then the view model becomes the model and the application becomes, the UI becomes the controller for that data. So your UI just want to interface with the view model to do what it needs to do. The view model has some operations and business logic that takes care of the operations. And then it can delegate to other classes for uh, dealing with more intense processing. For example, if you have a database or a repository to do synchronization, then the view model will just delegate to that and not do everything itself because otherwise you end up with a massive huge view model instead of a massive huge activity. So if you are able to separate the UI and the logic like that, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing, which I don't think is mentioned here, no, uh, is that you should never hold a reference to uh, an activity or a fragment or any sort of button or other view in the view model, because as we see on the life cycle, if you pass a reference to this activity to the view model, then you rotate your screen, that reference becomes invalid here because the activity has been destroyed and you have a new one. So you get a dangling pointer, so to speak, and uh, that's just bad. So the view model should not hold any references to views. So that is the first section of the view models. So what life cycles can view models use? So both activity and fragment are correct here. Service doesn't really have a life cycle in that regard that can be used with view models. And you cannot use it with an application because it's supposed to be tied to activities and fragments. So the really only things that can have view models attached to them are activities and fragments. Second question about view models. Which of the following is correct about view models? So there can be more, there can be one, there can be none. Well, there can be none actually, there has to be at least one. Yes, nice. It's kind of the boring alternative, but.
Nice, Agent X9. I suppose, I suppose because you're an agent, you're the fastest. So now we can either finish the slides on live data and do all of the examples at the end, or we can do the view model example first and then uh, go on to the slides about live data and then uh, finish up with the example for live data. So it seems pretty clear already. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose it's easier to digest um, what you just heard about view models if we just do the example up front. So uh, I'm going to check in here. Uh, speed wise, should I go slower or faster or nothing? Is it good, slower or faster? Okay. Yeah, it seems to be good. Okay, so let's go to the example. I will close this. And then we have to do the font, font size checks. Um, since you're all probably on your computers, I don't think I have to zoom in like crazy much. So just give me a yes or something similar if it's a good font size and readable. If not, I'll make it a little bit bigger. No complaints at least, so then I will keep it like this for now. Um, I can't see your reactions if I close this, so if you have any, if you change your opinion, then just let me know vocally. Yes, so yeah, let's look at the example. It's going to be basically exactly the same for as from last week except now we're not gonna focus on anything else. So what we have now is just our fragment, which has a variable that is number of clicks and a button that basically sets uh, the text of this, uh, this text field to number of clicks and then the number of clicks and the name is set to whatever you put in here. So if I type Carl and hit go, we get my name and we get one click. If I keep clicking, we get up to nine and we have lose the name because this is empty. And we get to 10 clicks. So this is when we store the variable in the fragment. So there shouldn't be a shock what happens when I rotate the screen. Um, you can think about this for two seconds, what you think will happen. And if you want to, you can also say it. But uh, the data is gone, basically. So this is probably something you would have struggled with on the first assignment as well, that the data is gone when you rotate the phone. And when you have the data in the fragment, that's what's going to happen because the fragment will be destroyed and then created again. So to fix this, we have to move this data into a view model so that we can use it. So, we, so it stays uh, consistent after rotations. Um, to create a view model, uh, um, we can go to new and then it should be under, well, if you have a fragment, if you're creating a fragment from scratch, there's a button in here for fragment with view model, which will create both a fragment and an attached view model. You can also go to activity and there should be, yeah, you can create an activity that comes with both a fragment and a view model. Or I don't think there is one for just the view model. but you just have to create a new file basically. And then you create an expense view model, which can inherit from view model. And that's how you create a view model. So now that's it's basic, pretty simple. Uh, there's also another class you can inherit from, which this one inherits from, which is called an Android view model. The difference between the two is that the Android view model has a, a access to your application context. So if you need to, do things in your view model that requires uh, knowledge about the application context, then you should inherit from Android view model instead. I'm going to inherit from Android view model here, 
uh, because uh, we're going to use a database afterwards and the database requires a context to be initialized. So to start with, we are going to just take the number of clicks out of the fragment and we are just going to slam it in here. We're going to make it accessible to anyone because it's just a piece of data that is now stored in the view model instead. And in the fragment, we currently do not have access to a view model. Like how do you get access to a view model? How do you create one? Now all of this is red, everybody is sad and nothing is going to work in compile. So to create a view model, it's very simple with the later versions of uh, the libraries that come with it. So you have to declare a new variable. So we're going to use private val because it never changes. It's just a reference to the view model. Uh, I'm gonna call it view model. And then you hit colon to decide the type of it. And our view model is called expense view model. So we say expense view model. And now comes the interesting part. So you have to use by which means it's going to be lazily initialized by something. And it's called view models. And then you do this. So now your view model will be of type expense view model will be initialized by view models, which is um, a factory function that comes with uh, the, the lifecycle library, which we included with Gradle uh, from the slides, basically. So this is how you would create a view model. And now you have access to all of the data in that view model and it's aware of your life cycle because you created it in a fragment. So we have to change um, these functions so they don't longer use number of clicks, but use view model dot number of clicks. And the same thing here. So if we change this one to view model dot number of clicks. So we change these from just number of clicks to view model number of clicks. And now if we run the application again, give it a number of clicks and rotate the screen, it still says six. So that's how easy it is to make sure your data gets retained with a view model. You create a view model class, put all of your variables that are related to uh, the UI that need to be retained, and then just initialize it with uh, the type of the view model and by view models. And now your data is basically retained between rotation and configuration changes. Uh, if, but the name, of course, currently isn't because the name isn't stored there. And likewise, if I go to new entry and then go back, it's no longer stored because the view model, since I changed the fragment, the other one is no longer on screen, which means by the time I go back here, it's created the view model all over again. And when the view model dies, of course, the data in it also dies. Um, there's, however, a solution for, between that as well. So that's what we, I was talking about when we have shared view models. So currently both of these fragments exist within a single activity. And this view model is scoped to the fragment. So there's another initializer that you can use, which is called activity view model. Doing this instead basically means now this view model is scoped to the activity uh, instead of the fragment, which means this one is alive for as long as the activity is alive. And since this application uses only one activity, that means if I run it now, give it a number of clicks, like six, go here and go back, it's still six because the activity never went out of scope. So if I now went into the other fragment and copied this exact same line, they would be using the same view model, which means if I change the number of clicks in here, it will also change in here. So I can do that really quick to show it. So I just copy this line, go to the other fragment uh, and paste the view model line just in here. And in on activity created, I will just go and say view model dot number of clicks equals 100. So now we, we use activity view models here as well. And we set number of clicks to 100. So if I go in here, nothing really happened and go back, it's now 100. So this is how you would share data between fragments that reside in the same activity. Um, so that's surprisingly simple and that's the way it's supposed to be. Let's just see nothing here. 
Um, yeah, so if you had an ex array of expenses instead, you could just copy this line and then add an expense to that array, and now you would be able to access it from the rest of your program. Um, so let's just quickly do the same to the name as well and move this back to not be shared between them because we don't need it to be shared here. So I'm just going to change this to the view model so it's just tied to the fragment itself. And then inside of the view model, I'm going to add uh, the text. So we'll call it just the name text. And it's going to be nothing by default. And in here, we're going to make sure that the name is set to view model name text. And when we click the button, we want to set the text as well to our view model dot name text. But then we also have to update view model dot name text equals views dot latest name dot text dot to string. So when now that we have added the string as well, it should be able to save both of those values. So if I go Bob, go. And while that looks almost correct, it doesn't quite look correct. But I think you took the label text. Oh, that might have happened. Yeah, probably did that. Yes, not the text field. You're right. Uh, what did I call that one? That's the one. Yeah, if I type Bob, and then now I will rotate the phone. Now they're both saved because they're both stayed in the view model, and we're updating the value accordingly. So that's basically it about view models. You normally want to have one for each uh, fragment, or if you have to share some data, you create a separate view model only for the shared data because fragments can have multiple view models. So if you have another one that is shared, you can have a shared view model that is some other view model class as well, for example, shared data. So, uh, but that's really how you get started with them. You have to create one class and inherit from view model or Android view model. And then you just can put your data in here. And normally you don't want everything necessarily to be public. You can have functions in here that operate on the data. For example, set name instead, uh, which would be an, a, which is what we're going to do to this one once we get to view models. No, sorry, live data, which is the next topic. Um, any questions about view models so far? I will click. Well, you said to keep a logic away from the view model, right? Sorry? Yeah, the, uh, away from the uh, fragment or activity. The view model can have some logic that's related to the data it holds, but it can delegate that to other, uh, to other classes, like the database, for example. So also it's worth noting that uh, view models have their own coroutine scope. So we talked about coroutines a few weeks ago. So you can use functions that are coroutines in view models. So that's extremely powerful because for example, we can write toast in two seconds. And then you can set that to the view model scope, which means this is a coroutine that will live for as long as the, maybe I didn't include coroutines in this uh, example. No, but anyway, if you can use view model, model scope uh, as a coroutine scope, which will oh, dot launch. Yeah, you can use this, which means this coroutine will run for as long as the view model is active. So if you do, if you're doing some background processing here, and you rotate your phone, the background processing is still going to run because it's tied to the scope of the view model and not the activity. So if you're doing some background processing like writing to a database, reading from some other database, uh, then you can use the view model scope in a coroutine. And this can be called from uh, any anywhere. You don't have to call it from a coroutine because it's not a suspend function. And it will run until the view model is closed. So if you change the fragment, then this will shut down. But as long as you, if you just rotate your phone, this one is going to keep running. So that's extremely nice if you're doing some processing and then the user rotates their phone 
and then you don't want the processing to be canceled. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the basics about view models. So uh, unless there are more questions, I will move on to the uh, live data. So I'm gonna see if that's okay for everyone. Uh, or if you want a break, you can uh, also pop a yes if you want a quick break. I don't see any big consensus for a break. So, so actually, I will have a quick bathroom break and then we will continue. So. Okay, I'm back. So if you're ready, just pop a yes, and then we'll keep going. Okay, nice. So, live data. So uh, what's that in one sentence? Uh, it's an observable piece of data that allow you to create reactive UIs. And the reactive UI is basically a UI that updates to the data. So if you have for example, that we have a number that is updated when we click the button. Uh, we want that we don't want to write any code to update the button. We just want the text to update itself whenever the value changes. So a reactive UI is a UI that changes whenever the data that it's observing changes. Uh, which means in terms of our code, we don't necessarily want to call set text whenever we click the button. We want the text to update itself. We just want to be able to assign this value. And then we want the uh, text to update itself whenever this value changes. So that's what we want to do with live data. Basically less code that's boilerplate about updating the UI and more focus on just changing the data and then the UI will update. So to use this with Gradle, you need to add uh, lifecycle live data which basically means that live data is also part of the lifecycle library because live data is also tied to a lifecycle like activity or fragments, just like the view model is. And live data is also very nice to use in conjunction with a view model because you can keep your li you should keep your live data inside the view model uh, that a fragment or an activity owns. So the benefits of this is that it's lifecycle aware, which means the live data knows if, for example, your button is visible on screen or not. So uh, if the button is not on the screen and you update something that changes the button or changes the text of, of some of your UI elements, if the live data knows that that's not on the screen, it's not going to update it. So if your database changes like a thousand times per second in the back end, and your live data keeps pumping out changes. If the element that uses it is not on screen, it's just not, it's not going to update anything, which means that's more efficient than if you are manually pulling the database, like have you changed, have you changed, have you changed, have you changed? Uh, instead, you will just be notified. And if it's not on screen, that it won't be notified. But when it comes back on the screen and if it's changed, then the UI will update again. 
Uh, it integrates well with other components. So for example, Room, which is the SQL database abstraction for Android. Uh, Room can directly return live data, which means as soon as anything in the database changes, the UI will change. We will look at this uh, as well afterwards. Um, and as I mentioned for this one, you don't have to check for updates manually. For example, if you change a value on a button, on a text field, or in a database, you don't have to go, if this has changed, do that. If this has changed, do that. Or check, have you changed, have you changed, have you changed? Uh, it's just going to update your UI whenever it changes, and you don't have to worry about that. Just worry about your data and your logic. Uh, which also means, naturally, that your UI will be consistent with the data. Uh, so if the data changes, your UI also changes, which is generally what you want, and that's a good thing. So you don't have to struggle with uh, seeing different things than what's in memory. Um, so no questions. I will leave this up for a couple of seconds if you want to write your questions, or if you don't want to uh, say them out loud, or if you want to say them out loud, that's fine as well. So no questions so far. There will be another question slide later. Uh, another thing you can do with live data is you can apply transformations to it. Uh, so what does that mean? So say if you have um, the concept of a user or an expense, since that's what we're working with, and the expense have a name, a description, and a value. And that value is in, uh, for example, Canadian dollars. And you want to display it to your user in American or Norwegian kroners. So you can apply a transformation to your live data uh, with something called a map mapping, which means you can get, you get live data, for example, from your database, you get the data with the expenses. Then you apply a transformation to that data, which does a currency conversion. And then you can subscribe in your UI to the transform data. And that's going to propagate. So that means if your database updates, the transformation is going to recalculate the new, uh, the new currency conver conversion for that particular value. And then your UI will see the currency conversion because that's the value it has subscribed to. And say if you have a couple of those transformations going, you can just change your UI from which of those it uh, subscribes to. So for example, if you want to have Norwegian, you can subscribe to the Norwegian live data, if not, you can subscribe to the Canadian one or the Australian one or some other currency. And you can just use that transformation to do it. So that's one transformation that's possible. Uh, you can also use that to, for example, make usernames uppercase, lowercase, uh, or do some other processing on the data and just pass it on, which means if the original data source gets an update, the transformation gets an update, and then your UI gets an update in the end. Uh, or you can transform one live data into another one, uh, which is what's called a switch map. So for example, if you uh, have a database of, again, say users this time, and then somewhere you store the user ID of the user you're interested in. So your user ID is a piece of live data. So if you update the user ID, then the data changes basically. And then you use a switch, switch map. It's nice in this case, because if you want to get information from your database about a particular user. Then you can use a switch map that basically takes the user ID in. And whenever the user ID changes, this one will emit another live data, which is going to be the live data that's in your database with information about that user, which means you sort of tie this data to this one. So when the user ID changes, you change the data that you fetch from the database. For example, if you want to just browse users from a list, you can just click different users and clicking the user will update the ID, which will trigger an update from the database to get information about that user, like their name, email, phone, or something, which means you just have to click things and it will propagate changes to fetch data from another source. And then you can subscribe to this source, which will then just contain the currently selected user information and not just their ID. We're going to uh, do this an example as well now with this, with the code that we have. So to the transformations can be somewhat tricky to understand, but uh, in the end, they're also, once you work with them once, the, they should be pretty fine to work with. And the map is very simple to work with compared to this one, at least to wrap your head around it. 
Uh, there's also one more kind of live data, which is just sort of like a, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's like a functional approach to live data. So we're just gonna look at that as well. And I think that was all the slides. So if you have any questions, pop them now. And if not, we're going to go into the example and go through basically adding live data to our example and uh, do an example of the transformations as well and all the types of live data. And we're gonna use it with the database. Okay, so is the speed still good? Slower, faster, or good? Okay, nice. So this one is done now, I'm gonna close it. So now we want to uh, start adding some live data to our view model. Because as I said, when we assign to the name text, we just want the UI to update um, instead of having to go set text manually. So for, to do that, we're going to first do it to number of clicks, and then we're going to do it to the name. Or let's actually just do it to the name, and then we then it's, it's the same approach for number of clicks. So uh, let's just do it to the name and then you'll understand how to, how to do it for the other one anyway. So to do this, we have to go to the RV view model. And in this case, we, in this first example, we are going to manage the live data ourselves and we are going to trigger any updates to it. So the first thing we have to do is to make sure that name text is no longer a string, but we want it to be live data that uh, hold that basically is a live data that holds a string, but, uh, it's a different type. So I'm going to make the va actual value of it. It's going to be a private. It's gonna be var because we're gonna to wanna to change it. Uh, and it's going to be of type mutable live data. And then it's gonna take a generic type, which is going to be string in this case. So our name text, I'm gonna prefix it as well is gonna be a mutable live data to string. So it being mutable means that we can change the live data. So through this variable, we can change it, which is why I've made it private in this case, because we only want the view model to be able to change it. Now from the UI, we want to, we need to be have, able to have access to it, but the UI shouldn't be able to write to it directly. So we're going to create a val that is called just name text. And this is val because uh, it's going to be, it's never going to be changed. It's going to be a live data that just references this one for all, all the time. So this, the value of this one will actually not change. So it's going to be name text and it's going to be a type just live data to string. So this one is not going to be mutable. So through this variable, you're not going to be able to edit this one. And then we're going to write get equals underscore name text, which means accessing this one, just kind of just in add accesses this one indirectly, but through a different type. So since mutable live data inherits from live data, um, this, this is going to work. So now when we get name text, we actually sort of get this val value, but through the interface that doesn't support mutating it. So if you're going to manage your own live data in the view model, managing your own live data in a view model. You need to have a private variable, basically that holds the actual value, and then just a public one uh, that references this one through a getter. But we also want to be able to update this value through our UI, but not directly. So in this case, I'm going to write a function to set the, set the name. I'm gonna call new name, it's gonna be a string, an optional string just in case the text field is empty. And in this case, you have two, two choices for name text. You have set value, which, will, which is okay if you're calling it from the UI thread. This will just set the value uh, directly. Then you also have post value, 
post value is what you want to do if you're on a background thread and want to update this value. That's going to update it in the next tick, basically. Uh, instead of right away, it's going to happen the next sort of frame. So posting the value is what you want to do from background thread, set value, which is just going value equals. Uh, is what you want to do if you're on the UI thread, which we are going to be because we're going to call this from the UI. So set name is going to just going to set the value. And if it's null, then it's going to be the empty string. So now we have to go back to our fragments and start using this one instead. So here we can no longer set this one. So we want to instead call viewmodel.setName. And then we can just pass this text in here. Likewise, in our latest name, we don't want to set it manually anymore. So get rid of that. Uh, right now, nothing is going to happen if I enter a name, at least not in the UI. I can write voila, voila, and it doesn't change. I probably should have given it a default. So in order to have the UI update to this, uh, we need to be able to uh, observe this live data. So the live data is observable, which means we need to observe it in order to get any values from it and to make sure that we get the values when they change. So to uh, observe a live data, we have to go through our view model because it's stored on the view model. So view model dot and we are interested in the name text, which is a live data of a string. And this one has a method called observe. So if we call observe, we have to pass this a lifecycle owner. So this is basically what, what's the lifecycle that's going to observe this? Is it a fragment? Is it an activity? And based on that, that's how the live data is going to know if it's going to update your value, if it's going to wait updating your value, it's going to know when to unsubscribe you because you don't have to unsubscribe yourself because since the view model knows when you're alive, the view model is going to take care of unsubscribing you automatically. Sorry, the live data is going to do that. So in a fragment, you have two, uh, you have two uh, life cycles. You have a fragment life. You have just you have just the life cycle of the fragment, uh, which is going to be active for as long as the fragment is active. And likewise, you have the view life cycle owner, which basically means it's going to live as long as the views in your fragment. Uh, and the difference between them is that the fragment is is going to this one is going to be lasting longer basically because if you create an instance of a fragment and just store it around but it's not actually on screen anywhere the views are still alive which means this one will still be alive so some of you in assignment one had uh, fragments stored here for example a fragment stored here if you use the view lifecycle owner that means for as long as this variable is alive uh, the view, the live data will uh, be alive. If you just use the live cycle, that means only when the fragment itself is on screen. So most of the time, uh, personally, I use view uh, view life cycle uh, since that causes the view model or the live data to update less often. Which means um, since the, since the views are kept around for longer, the data will be kept around for longer as well. If you have lots of data that can be expensive to hold around in memory, you might just want to use a regular life cycle instead since it lives shorter. Um, and in here, you now have a lambda, which gets a string because that's the type of the live data. And this is where you tell it what to do with the string. So whenever the name text value updates, we want to go and set our, uh, this is our latest name. I want to set the text to get string, r.string.name uh, I think it's label name. 
I'm going to have to check it in the expense list. Um, this one is called latest name. No, it's not. The string resource is called label name. Yeah, so that's this one. And then the argument is it, because that's the string we get. So you have to write this observe code that tells the you tells the live data what to do with the value. But now, if we run the application, currently the name is empty. If I write hello, hit go, uh, the name has now updated. Even though we never told the UI to do this, we just set the name in the view model. And then the view model said, hello, this value has changed. And then we got an observer callback. So however, whatever we do now, it's going to update as soon as the data changes. Because we, our only way to change the data is through the live data. And then the live data, anything that subscribes to this, you can subscribe to this with this text, this text, uh, some button, whatever you want to subscribe and happen. You can have a toast trigger every time it changes. We can go toast but make text within hello I changed. We can have a toast trigger every time you change the value. So now even though you're setting the name it's going to toast every time it changes, which is uh, uh, annoying in this case. But, or you can have this one trigger a database. You can insert a value to the database. You can like, basically any time the value changes, you can decide what happens because you're observing the value. So any questions about this so far? Um, the recap is you need the private variable that's holding the value, uh, a public one that is just a live data that people can subscribe to. And then you have some functions that you can call that basically update this value. And that's when you manage it yourself. And finally, you have to observe the value through your view model and then decide what happens. OK. Um, the next thing we will look at is how to do this with a database because obviously live data is a lot more powerful with a database in this case than with when you manage the value yourself because the database will actually have data updating in it. Uh, it will change and uh, you don't necessarily control this because if it's a remote database that you're synchronizing with, you would like it to update live as well. So this does not only work with Broom. You can implement live data for Firebase as well, which is very powerful because Firebase will already uh, update. It's a real-time database. So wh whenever a thing changes in Firebase, it, it can change on your app as well. And with live data, you, just, you can just put the data into the Firebase app. And as long as there's internet connection, your app will update live as well through the live data. So that's a possibility. It's not built into Android, so you have to do the implementation yourself, but uh, there's a example implement implementation if you just Google it. But next, we will add support for a database in here. So number of clicks, if you wanted to do this a number of clicks, it basically is the same just for this variable as well. Example two, using room with live data. So in this, a uh, code example that I will provide to you. It's basically a continuation of the one from last week. We have a database. Uh, so we're going to use the room with that database. And that's the database which holds our expenses. So I'm going to get hold of the database through our expense. And this is why I wanted to have the application and use an Android view model in here, because since room to create a database requires a context, and I'm going to store the database in the view model. That means I need the, the context here. So I'm going to be able to pass its application in here. So now we have an access, have a handle to the database. We want the database itself to be private uh, because we don't want others to touch the database, but we are going to provide that data from the database uh, through our live data. So let's take a quick look at what we have available on our database. Uh, currently, we can access expenses. We have one function that is basically get all expenses. 
and it returns a live data with a list of expenses. So Rune, as mentioned, has really great support for live data. So we can just add live data as the return type and Rune will take care of the live data and Rune will make sure that we, if this, anything in this query updates, then you will get new live data. You will get the, the update. So if you, for example, insert an, an element that changes anything with, from this query, you will instantly get the result back, which means as soon as your data changes, your UI will update. Uh, the old way of doing this would be to just not have live data here, and then you would have to do this in a background thread. Or if you're a coroutine, you could put suspend in front, and now you can call this from a coroutine and just get the values instantly. In this case, we are returning live data. And if you could change the query so it's uh, less inclusive because this just selects everything, the live data will only update if it affects uh, the query. Uh, will this affect performance if the uh, query is like really complex? Yeah, if it's a huge query, then it's going to be slow depending on how you use the data. So if you put it in a recycler view, for example, and show all of the data and it's thousands of values, uh, that's uh, going to be kind of slow. But uh, there's a library for that as well that's called a uh, paging library. It's uh, If you look up room and paging, that's basically a library that allows you to just get parts of the data and as you scroll you keep loading it. Um, so that's a solution to working with huge databases. There's a, it's called, we even just look it up, room paging. So yeah, so this is basically allows you to get the live data of a page list. So instead of using a list, you will use a page list. We, and Room will take care of that by ensuring that you only get, for example, 50 elements per page, which means you, you save on the performance and the internet connection there, if it's a huge data set. Anyway, we are now going to use this one and we're going to populate a recycler view in our uh, expense list. So as you can see here, there's a expense item. Um, sorry if that was fast. It, I don't want to spoil anything yet. Uh, so through this function, we get live data. And we have access to this database now through the view model. So in the view model, we're going to have a public variable, just call it uh, all expenses. And that's going to be equal to database. And we're going to go with, not supposed to be bookings, but expenses. And we're going to get all expenses. So the type of this one is now live data to a list of expenses. So if you subscribe to this value from the UI, we now get a list of expenses back. Uh, and that can be used to populate a recycler view. So let's go to our back to our fragments. And now we basically got the live data from the database, just, just one line of code. And then we have to observe it. So we're gonna go observe database live data. Through our view model, we're now gonna to subscribe to all expenses. Dot observe again, and we're gonna use the same scope. So view lifecycle owner. But instead of a string, we now get a list of expenses. And since I already have a recycler view set up here, um, if I just go it's called expense list. Um, and we have to get the adapter that's special for this one. So it's dot adapter because the adapter is the one that holds the values. And this is an expense adapter. So that's just uh, for this example, we have to use the adapter that this one uses, which we are setting here. So here we're taking the setting the adapter to be an expense adapter. That's why we're using it here. And this one has a method called submit list, which takes a list of expenses. So we just have to pass it, pass it the list of expenses. Uh, which means now if anything changes in the database, this recycler view will get that those updates. So let's run it. And suddenly we have some elements from the database in the list, um, which is nice. So 
the next thing we want to do is just to be able to add more elements to the database so we can see that it updates live. Um, and we want to do that through a new entry. So when we type the values and hit confirm, we're going to put it into the database. So this is also sort of a small recap on Room then. If, if you haven't worked on it, worked too much with it yet, this is a great chance to just get a quick recap. So inside of our expense data access object, uh, we actually already have the insert method here, which is just called insert expense. And it takes an expense that we're going to insert. And if we go to the view model, we have a function that's commented out here. That's just called new expense. Takes a string description and an amount with float. And launches a coroutine that goes through the expenses. That's not imported. And we call it through the database. We call insert expense which is this function right here. All you have to do in room is say that it's, this is at insert and it takes an expense. You can also make this a list of expenses and now you can insert, that's basically like inserting many elements. So if you have many elements you want to insert, you can have insert many expenses and you would be able to insert as many as you need. But we just need to insert one. So we're just calling this function from the, from the view model. Now, Technically, I might want to create a separate view model for the expense entry that just is able to do this. Um, to, to keep it simple for the example, we're going to just use the same view model, but different instances of it. So in our expense entry fragment, which is going to correspond to, and the reason I'm using the assignment, uh, sort of expense assignment-like thing here is that you'll be sort of familiar with uh, the different components. So we're going to have to add the view model here as well. Like so. And then in our confirm button in the onclick listener, we want to just use this. So we're gonna go view model dot uh, in new expense. And the name is going to be, and now I have to remember the fields. So this one is called name field and then description field. So the name is name field dot text dot to string. The description is the description field text to string and the float I've already gotten it here through the amount. And then with our navigation, we're going to use find nav controller and navigate up, which basically it's like hitting the back button, back button. So when, when we confirm, we're going to insert the database and go back. And the cancel button basically just uh, goes up. So this is building, as I said, on last week's stuff. So what this should do now is that once we click the button, we should insert a new element into the database. And since this is subscribed to that, it should instantly update. So let's try that. Um, let's take Christopher pay Marius for dinner at a very expensive restaurant, actually very much, very expensive. So if we confirm now, there we go, the element comes and it's actually too expensive for this list. But yeah, we instantly saw that coming in. I'm gonna put one at the top as well. I'm gonna call it Arnold paid for food. And then if I hit confirm, you see it comes into the list and I can scroll the list because it's a recycler view. So it li updates live and we get some nice animation when it pops in. So I can add another one called also me pay for electricity. And then if I hit confirm, I have to show up in there. So basically now we have live data set up with the database and we instantly get the updates as soon as the database changes. Of course, our clicks are still updating as well. And when we hit type our net type the name, and this one is still working. And if I rotate, likewise, as with the other one, uh, well, turns out this is a bit buggy because I don't have a scroll view. So <laughs> anyway, the data is there. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is just the other types of live data. We're going to look look at the transformations and the 
live live data in a way. So yeah, let's put this one up with the other example that's relevant. So now we have this first example, the second example, and now the third example is gonna be example three uh, using the live data lambda in a way. I don't, I, there's probably an official name for it. I don't remember it, but say we just want to have some arbitrary value uh, and we want to, we don't really want to mess around with all of this stuff because uh, this is, you know, not necessarily very readable. It requires three lines. Uh, or we don't want to have a database. We just have some data that we need to update regularly. Um, so let's create that. So let's create time since reset. And so there's with the live data library, there is a construct called live data like this. Uh, in here, you can just do some computations and at the end you can dump up some live data. So for example, I can just emit zero here. And you have to use the functions in here emit to emit the value. So whenever you call emit, it's basically gonna update the live data. Uh, I'm gonna make it afloat here. So we wanna subscribe quickly to this live data in the uh, expense list. So again, the same thing, view model dot time since reset dot observe, view lifecycle owner, and now here we get a float. And now we're gonna have our uh, live info, which is what I called it. Set text to get, get string r dot string dot live updates and the parameter is going to be it as a string. Let's just see, look at the formatting here. Live update takes, yeah, it should be a float. So uh, 4.2F, that means, uh, yeah, you should be familiar with formatting. Yeah, like this. So if we look at this now, did I forget something? Clearly. Right, it's just uh, when I set the default value, which is no longer necessary. Um, I was just setting some defaults in on create view. Uh, that is no longer necessary since uh, the live data will take, make sure that the moment you subscribe to it, if there's a value, it's going to uh, also update it. So. so now we have live 0.0, .0 because that's the value we emitted. Uh, but that's kind of boring uh, because it's just a value. So now we're going to write some questionable code. Uh, while true, uh, var time equals 3.1. So any sane person, uh, let's actually get your opinion on this code. Would you think this is good safe code in a regular sense. No. Because logically if you have a while true loop you're going to freeze the application everything's going to like burn and crash to the ground. However uh, this live data stuff runs it in its own coroutine so everything is here in here is in fact a coroutine so we get back to the coroutines again. Uh, it follows the scope of uh, the live data, which again follows the scope of uh, whatever data it's updating. So we have a time, zero. As long as it's true, we emit the time value incremented by the time we're delaying. So 0 0.01 and then we sleep for 10 milliseconds. And then we come back and just keep doing this. 
So the effect this is going to have on the UI is that every 0.01 second, it's going to emit a new value here, which means you now have a timer for how long it is since the live data was reset. So if we try to change the fragments and go back, we see that this was reset. Okay, so that, that reset the live data. Let's try to rotate it. That did not reset it, so it's still there. If we rotate it back, the value is still there. So now we know that this one only actually changed when we do that. If we close the application and then reopen it, it's now at two seconds. We wait three seconds, go back. So it didn't reset. So if you just do that, it still stays. And if you close the application entirely, then it's of course is destroyed. So as long as your application is just suspended and that fragment is alive, this one is going to exist. But as you noticed, when I closed it, the live data didn't actually emit anything because the view is not on screen. So it, it actually waited and that's the performance thing. So now we have a live timer that just updates every 0.01 seconds. So that's the third kind of live data. Uh, the final kinds of live data are the transformations. So we're going to just put this one down to 0.1 and sleep for 100 milliseconds instead, just so we don't flood it with updates. Um, example number four, uh, using uh, transforms. Um, also, uh, one thing I forgot to mention about this live data is that there's another function you can use as well that is called emit source. What that does is basically it takes another live data and you can emit the other live data. So if we're, for example, if I want to instead emit, um, and now it has to actually be a live data of a double or a float. But if I had another live data I wanted to emit, then I could do that as well. So the why would you would want to do that? Uh, it could be, for example, with this database, uh, if this was not, or with this one even, you could have a, you could actually say, wow. So this is the name text. So we can have upper case name text equals live data. And we can take our source and just emit our name text. So it, you can basically emit another source and have it be this one. So we could technically now get rid of this and just use this one instead, for example. Anyway, the transforms are going to be a bit interesting. So as you have noticed, we currently have the name, that the latest name of the user that you entered. So if I enter, Arnold, that's going to be stored here. So what if we want to somehow filter this list based on the name? So then we could use a switch map uh, and use the live data for the current name for what we're going to switch on. And then we can have a database query that only gets any value that matches this, uh, the last entered name. And that's where we can use a switch map transformation. So let's do that right now. First, we have to go to the database and add a function that supports uh, getting an expense that currently for only a single name. So we're going to do a query, which is select everything from, well, not quirt, everything from expenses, which is the name of our table, where name like colon name, uh, that's going to work soon. And let's just do the same thing here where we want to order by name ascending. And we're going to call it get all expenses for, and then we're going to go name and the string. So that now you see this one is fine. So if you have a parameter here, you can use colon that parameter name in the query. And then we have a return again, just a live data with list of expenses. So this query is going to only get the expenses for whoever have a name like this. And it's going to be ordered the same way. So now we're going to create a transformation in here. We are going to call it uh, all expenses for. 
and we're going to set it to db dot expenses dot get all expenses for. But that wouldn't work because this takes a string, and since this is a type live data string, it's not going to work. So to do this, we have to use the transformation. So there's a class called transformations, and it has inside of it, in this case, the switch map. So what you have to pass to this is you have to pass it one live data, a live data. So this is the live data we're going to switch on, and that's going to be, in this case, the name text. And then there's a lambda in here that has to return some other live data. Uh, and in here, we're going to use our database, get all expenses for, and since we get the value of the live data that we pass in here, it's a string. like this. So now we're switching on the name text. So whenever this live data changes, we're going to update our database query to get the names for whatever name was there. Um, however, not name text is not always going to have a value. So we're going to have a little bit more logic in here. So we're going to say if it.length equals zero, uh, then we're just going to go ahead and return all expenses, else we are going to just use the expenses for that name. So if we don't have a name, there's probably a better way. Yeah. So if it's empty, then give all the expenses. Otherwise, just give the expenses for the name that we have entered. So now we have a switch map that basically switches what source uh, it switches based on. So if the name text live data is empty, we get all the expenses. Otherwise, we're going to change what source we're doing to. And this is also going to take care of them. Subscribing, if we subscribe to this one, and this case happens, it's going to unsubscribe for this one and subscribe to this one. And if it suddenly becomes this one, it's going to make, take care of unsubscribing and resubscribing. So uh, it's quite a powerful concept. But now we have to go to our list and just change so we don't subscribe, subscribe to the expense list anymore. No, sorry, we don't have to subscribe to all expenses, but all expenses for. And that's the only change we have to make. Which means in here, we currently have everything. We hit go, nothing changes. If I type Carl, hit go, now it's only mine. I can hit Arnold and without a comma, hit go, and we get only Arnold. Or if I just hit go, we get everyone. So right now we have. Um, we are using a live data to switch based on a filter. We're gonna, we're gonna be able to filter. This could also just as easily have been a search. If we change the SQL query to be, um, instead of match exactly, we could use, uh, use the percentages to say if it contains this. So for example, I could type Arl or R A R, and both Arnold and Carl would show up. But I'll leave that as an, that as an exercise to you guys to do that. Um, so that's, that's how you would do that. Uh, the final transformation is just the map, which is what takes a live data and just puts out a value instead of another live data. So for that, let us let us just um, figure out what the top expense is. So right now it's Christopher's dinner for Marius, which is ten thousand dollars, or technically Norwegian kroners, but the UI is showing dollars here. Um, so we're going to use the transformation to find the top expense. So back in the view model, we are going to do one more example. That's example five, which is a live data map transformation. And we're going to call it the top expense. And that's going to be not a switch map in this case. We're just going to use a transformations.map. And it takes a live data as its source. So to see how this can be chained together, I'm going to use all expenses for as the source. And back we get the list of expenses. So you know, if you're observant, you might have noticed that we, why don't we just get the query where we select uh, the element order by value and that's it. Yeah, we could have done that, but uh, which probably would have been better. 
but uh, for this case, it's for the purpose of demonstrating this transformation. So we're going to find the top value equals it dot max by it dot amount. So we're going to find the top value by finding a max by the amount. So this is now the expense with the highest value. If the list is empty, uh, so basically we're gonna have to we're gonna do first if the if the list is empty, then we are just gonna output no max. Otherwise, we're gonna find the top value, and we're gonna output top value. Uh, let's see dot name which is the name of the person pay the top value dot amount i guess this can be null yeah so let's just make sure instead that we take let's do this instead So if top value is not null, then we output top value name paid this much. Uh, otherwise, we are going to just say no max. So the difference between the two, as you can see, switch map takes in the live data and it uses that live data to choose uh, what other live data is going to output instead. So get all expenses for, if the text has a value, it's going to use this data source with the key that came in. This one just takes a live data, does some operation to it, and outputs a new value. So now this, the type of top expense, is a live data of string. So what we get in is a list live data with list of expenses, but out we get the live data of string. So you can change the types here. The types also change here, technically. But now you output the value directly instead of some other source. So now we're going to subscribe to this value. Uh, same thing again. We're going to go view model dot top exp no sorry you yeah that's correct view model dot top expense observe same thing view lifecycle owner and here we get a string so we're gonna go and access our top expense set the text get string r dot string dot top expense and the value is gonna be it. And this, so this is observe map transformation. So finally, now we can look at this. So now we say the top expense is Christopher paid 10,000. But since this data source is based on, uh, also based on all expenses for, if I type Carl in here and hit go, now this no, the, now the top expense is that I paid five thousand because I used the other data source. I used the same data source in this one instead of the entire data set. So now the top expense is also going to update based on the top expense for the currently visible users. So if I reset it, it's back to Christopher paying ten thousand. If I do some random name, it says no max because that person has no entries in the database. And that's. In the end, basically it. Um, those are the main use cases you're gonna have for live data. That's is examples for how you use how you use them. So let's transform transform switch map from one data source to another. You have map from one data source to a value. You have the live data you, that you control yourself. and emit values, or you can emit other data sources. Uh, you can use it with room directly, which is just gonna interact with the query. As long as your query returns live data, then it's good. Uh, do note if you use live data here, you cannot use suspend because one, it makes no sense because this data is already uh, an asynchronous value. So suspend is not gonna work here. Uh, 
so all you have to do is return live data with a compatible return type. So if you're returning multiple values, you use a list. If it's a single value you want to get out, then you just want to use expense. So I mentioned we could have done the max value with a query. So I'll just show that quickly as well. So select everything from expenses order by amount descending, and then we want to limit it to one result. Fun get highest expense. And that would be a live data to a single expense. So this would have been the database query that does exactly the same thing, and that would probably have been better. But of course, in this case, this wouldn't take account for um, the fact that we are now filtering it based on the currently visible ones. In that case, we would have to also pass a name in here, get highest expense for some name, right? So by doing it this way, we are now, we're more flexible about it. We don't have to add another query. So I know this is probably, this is like always it's going to be a lot of information, but hopefully you've been able to see the power of using the view, mo view models and live data and how to combine them to create great reactive UIs um, and avoid a lot of the headaches. So you can focus more on the program or like the application and the logic you want to create yourself instead of dealing with the nitty gritty, checking the UI and all of that. Uh, you get access to powerful features like switch maps and maps that allow you to transform data and update it as it shows in the UI. As I mentioned, we could have made the name here automatically capitalize itself, be, be all uh, uppercase, lowercase. Uh, all of this data survives rotation changes. You've seen how you can share data between activities and fragments by using an activity view model instead. And we can add, we can add, And we can add values to the database that get updated live. Um, yeah, that's basically it for me. Uh, any questions are welcomed. And uh, to give you a teaser on next week, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of boilerplate for all of this shit that we have to observe all the time. Um, so, Going from the start of the semester where you have to do all this manually to this is obviously a huge improvement, um, but Android can do it even better. So next week we are going to look at how we can do all of this stuff the same way and get rid of all of this boilerplate and still have the UI update. So we're going to have basically zero boilerplate in here and have all of the UI updates regardless. So it's going to be a lot cleaner code for managing your UI, so you can focus even more on what your play application is doing instead. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay, let's see the chat. Is this the chat? Is that the chat, or is it somewhere else? We can't see what you're seeing, but if you see a question, that's the chat. Um, right chat oh there is a chat yeah i can see it now oh there is a chat nice that's good to know at the very end of the lecture two five is fine sounds fine yep yep art yep there's chat yep i'm not reading it definitely not yep that's correct it's marish <laughs> I will push this, I will put it on the GitLab because it's basically a continuation from last week and we will keep working on this example next week when we get rid of all of this boilerplate and keep the functionality and make it, make it even cooler. But yeah, so I will zip this up and put it on the web so you can use it for reference. And uh, uh, yeah, and as a refresher. And this app is currently set up pretty best practice in terms of view models and uh, room and recycle view so you can use it as a reference for that as well in addition to of course the official do google documentation so unless there are any other questions uh, i hope you are going to be interested to show up for next week when i get rid of this stuff because who wouldn't want cleaner code uh, i'm gonna say thank you for today and uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture today and uh, so yeah i'll be here until 12 for questions and then yeah and there's graphics. So anyone who's going to graphics, you will see me in graphics.
graphics now as well. And I hope the recording worked. I just Zoom to have done this correctly. It does say on our screen it's recording, so.